Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 69. You're watching two of your favorite Anglicans talk about all things Anglican. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And this week's episode is brought to you by the new Wineskins Missionary Conference in Ridgecrest, North Carolina. And today is March 29th, 2013. George, moving on here to story one, and if you don't have cable TV, the internet, well, I guess you wouldn't be watching us, but go with me here. If you don't have cable TV, the internet, get the paper, or have any friends with opinions, you probably don't know the biggest story this week is the U.S. Supreme Court taking up two cases on same-sex marriage and whether or not the court can issue the, the prevalence of marriage to people who are not male and female that want to join together. We call that for all intents and purposes, same-sex marriage here in America. Um, the court is dealing with a law in California called Proposition 8, where the people of California voted into the majority to say that we want marriage in California to be between a man and a woman. Um, in the de democracy, we kind of allow people to speak for that. They also taking up what we call the DOMA case, the Defense of Marriage, which was passed in 1996 by the United States Senate and signed by Bill Clinton, which said that in America, we understand that marriage is between a man and a woman. And signed in different times, I agree to that. But now it's before our U.S. courts, and our U.S. courts have to decide whether or not they want to enter into the um, legal arrangements of deciding finally, at a federal level, what marriage is or what marriage isn't. George and I have the opportunity to discuss this because I've been married for 24 years in May. George, how long have you been married? 28 years in June. And I can assume you've been married to one wife? Oh, yes, yes. Same person all those years. <laughs> Same here. So George and I can speak to what marriage is and what marriage isn't. George, let's go quickly and, and look at the biblical interpretation of what marriage is. Well, you know, in our, in our Anglican and in our Episcopal uh, liturgies, mar the purposes and the aims of marriage are set out very clearly. It's for the procreation of the children, for mutual aid and comfort. It's, uh, it's a prophylactic against sin. It has all these purposes, but it comes down to a basic understanding that marriage is one of God's natural laws. Male and female, he created them. And in marriage, we come together, male and female, one for life, an exclusive lifelong relationship that becomes one unit for the propagation of the species. It's the basic, basic uh, building block of our society and of our world. And it's got nothing to do with the government. It doesn't. And yet we look at the, the characteristic of male and female and there are still limitations in marriage to what males and what females can get married to each other. Uh, we don't allow fathers and daughters or brothers and sisters or first cousins um, to marry because obviously marriage in that context is not what marriage is. So marriage is not just defined by um, the male and female, it's defined in context of what God wants to use that relationship for. And God wants to use the relationship of marriage to form what we call a family. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's used in a much broader context. It's not there just to fulfill your sexual desire or affirm your attraction. And that's where we have found folly. George, let's talk about what marriage isn't, just so we get... There's probably people out there who don't know what it is not. Um, marriage is not a uh, contract uh, to obtain legal rights. All right, marriage. Marriage has been used and is used by the government to regulate tax policy, to regulate mm -hmm. insurance policy, to regulate pension policy. The government has taken marriage and used it as a convenient way to govern the people. However, it did not create marriage. The, the marriage state is not that contract. It's not... Um, um, it's not a financial relationship. It can be, and it is used as such. But it's just sort of like the Social Security number system. You know, the Social Security <laughs> number, according to the government, is only to be used for Social Security purposes. 
Well, social security numbers are used for everything from your IRS to your banking to everything. Now, does that mean that the social security number is controlled by your taxes or your driver's license or things like that? No, not at all. It has just been co-opted by other parts of the government for its convenience. That's the same with marriage. Uh, it's interesting. Marriage works so well that the government said this is good. We want to support it. And they've made laws that support marriage and encourage marriage in their countries. Marriage is good. Now, we've come to the point where people say, I want the right to be married, or I want the right to those legal um, benefits of being married. And here's where things start to go haywire, and we have what we call people wanting same-sex marriage. In America, and you may or may not do this, but um, we have people who are attracted to the same sex as themselves and live in relationships with those people. Um, they have found throughout you know, the last 20 or 30 years that there's government programs that are available to married people that aren't married to, uh, made to them. In some states, they've overcome this by offering um, what we call civil unions, but that really wasn't enough. In many states, you can have the same rights as married people, but it still doesn't have the word marriage. This has come a step further. They've demanded that the word marriage be applied to them because it has so many more connotations than a civil union does, not in just rights, but in the expression of what the definition of marriage is. Marriage is something that's blessed by the church, blessed and encouraged by the government. Why can't you bless and encourage our same-sex relationships? Oh, this gets complicated, George. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I mean on one level, you, it is a cry for people of a certain group of people to have their particular views made paramount in society. We believe that certain thing to be true. We believe our relationship is a marriage. And we want the government to enforce that view by making you believe it to be true also. In other words, people are using the legal system to coerce others into their points of view. That's profoundly totalitarian. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, not only is language being corrupted and natural law being corrupted, but this sense that the government can now turn black into white, turn, turn what is basic in our natural created order around just for the political convenience of a small group, that's monstrous. That really is monstrous. Yeah, it's what Americans do all the time. Let's talk about the, the service, service of marriage. Uh, it is assumed by many people who are uninformed, not like you and I, that uh, the church marries people. Well, and that the, most the, clergy are ignorant. And... <laughs> yeah, the, the church does not marry anyone, George. Right. The only, if you look at the marriage ceremony in the Anglican and the Episcopal traditions, the only thing a priest is required for is the nuptial blessing. And that's mm -hmm. the thing at the very end. The, will this man take this woman and all that stuff, that can be done by a deacon. It can be done by anybody. It is only that the priest is required for the nuptial blessing. And people seem to assume that a priest marries people. That's not true. He solemnizes and makes and is, presides over the public celebration of two people joining together. When I bury someone, I haven't killed them. Well, not usually. But I am presiding over their burial. When I'm marrying someone, I'm not marrying them. I'm presiding over the public commitment ceremony. It, and... A lot of people in the church who are pushing for the church to bless gay marriages don't seem to understand what the church's proper role is in all this. And they're trying to upend not only 2,000 years of church tradition, but the underlying natural law that of how the world works and the universe is ordered for something that no one has really quite given a good logical and explanation for. This is obviously going to be an ongoing story, and I don't want to devote all of Holy Week to discussing uh, same-sex marriage on Anglican Unscripted. Let's talk about the fallout. If uh, the government decides or the, the Supreme Court decides that they need to redefine what marriage is here in America, there's going to be ramifications for that to the church. We've watched in Canada the rights of the church be completely washed away uh, after 19, their 1990 decision, somewhere in the 1990s, to have homosexual marriage. The church went from a place that could openly uh, 
uh, tell people what marriage was, to uh, explain um, the, the uh, folly of homosexual attraction and all that, to having no rights whatsoever. The, a, a Canadian priest is not uh, legally allowed to speak against um, homosexuality. That is something that will soon apprise itself here in America when the rights of a minority in a totalitarian way are given over the rights of the majority. We understand the principles of wanting the same legal rights, and both George and I agree, um, any person should have the same legal rights in America under American law. It's taking that to the step of only what God introduced, marriage between a man and a woman, and redefining that. George, um, are we going to have two marriages if the court goes this way? Well, we're going to have, certainly have a place where there is God's understanding of marriage as laid out in the Holy Scriptures. And then there's the state institution, which can be called whatever it wants to be called. Mm -hmm. But marriage is not going to change. The state laws may change. The federal laws may change. We, we may have see a situation where we have with abortion laws, where the Supreme Court stepped in, and then for 30, 40 years afterwards, we've had a polarized society on this issue because democracy was not allowed to work. The court may be smarter this time around and allow the voters to decide how they wish to see this thing worked out. I don't know what the answer is going to be, but at the end of the day, God's still in charge and his word still reigns supreme. Yeah, in, in the end of the day, we need to care most about what God identifies as marriage, who he identifies as being married, and it, he doesn't identify us by our social security number or our genitals or our orientation. God is the one who defines us. George, let's move on here to story two, and we're going to talk about what the Episcopal Church has been up to this week. Um, not without controversy, we're going to go to a quote that's lasted quite a while, and it's really apt this week. And that's the quote from John Christostom, the, the saint, that says, The road to hell is paved with skulls of erring priests with bishops as their signposts. And it's not like John Christosom is an Episcopalian or has been paying attention to what's going on here in America. But this week, the Episcopal Church, the House of Bishops, decided that they would march and use the signs of the cross uh, um, time as a, ch a chance to march against gun violence. And I think once again, the Episcopal Church has missed the mark. But this is not something that really interests you, is it, George? Uh, the words fatuous idiots come to mind, Kevin, when I think about this. Uh, feckless, slack-jawed troglodytes who have no clue what the Christian faith is all about. <laughs> you know, these, these, yeah. you, you, let's, mar you know, the Stations of the Cross are a devotional that we have taken over from the Catholic Church and incorporated into many parishes where we meditate upon Christ's sufferings as he approaches Calvary. It's not a time to use to propagate the latest, greatest social justice fads. Don't get me wrong. Gun violence is a terrible thing. I'm against people killing people with guns. What, and I'm also against the watering down of our Christian faith into some sort of feel-good, politically correct silliness. It's true. Let's be honest. To today, you're watching this hopefully on Good Friday or this week. Good Friday, for all intents and purposes, is the greatest cliffhanger in, in history. Uh, it was on this day that we understand that Christ died. And to you and I, we have no real feeling of what that is other than what we can put into our 21st minds. However, back in 33 AD, when Christ died on Good Friday, that was it. Their, their Messiah had come and died, and we, they've entered into hopelessness. All his promises and all that he had was, was you know, protect, presented to them to the bee was, was for naught. He was just another human, just another teacher, just another prophet, and in the end, he died too. Thus the cliffhanger. And what the Episcopal Church did is miss the opportunity to really tell people about the last week of Jesus Christ on earth. 
-hmm. you missed an opportunity to present the gospel. The good news, which in a society where we have gun violence, where we have a president who killed more people um, with drones, he killed more children with drones um, than all the assault weapons here in America did last year, you, you missed the mark. You didn't, you, you're not going after the big numbers. What are you trying to go after here? I don't understand why you miss the opportunity to witness to the, the Holy Scripture, the Holy God, and the loving transformation that Holy Week was all about. Well, Kevin, to be fair, if, mm -hmm. George, if George Bush was pursuing this drone policy of killing children with uh, unmanned uh, pilotless aircrafts over Afghanistan and Pakistan, the House of Bishops would be marching down Pennsylvania Avenue with signs saying, Bush lied, children died. But since it's Barack Obama, the Episcopal Church is not going to protest the drone policy. We live in the sad fact that we, we, we live for the analogy. We live for what's the deeper meaning of all this. You don't have to go for a deeper meaning of the Stations of the Cross. It's right there. Look, it's, you know. And, and, I, and Kevin, I, I don't want to let the Episcopal Church off the hook here because one of the canonical rules of the Episcopal Church for the first 125 years of its existence was that it did not get involved in politics. Mm -hmm. The Episcopal Church's general convention up until the late 1900s did not issue statements on the Civil War, on the Spanish-American War, on issues facing the country because it believed that good men and women of good will can disagree on political issues and the church should not get involved in that and focus on bringing people to a saving faith in Jesus Christ and allow lay Episcopalians to argue the merits, moral and political, of issues. But the church, as a church, as an institution, should focus like a laser on Jesus Christ, not on mosquito nets, not on gun violence, not on the Millennium Development Goals, all good things, but outside the work of the institutional church. And we, as an institution, have lost that and now, you know, gun control as an issue, that had its political heyday in November, December. The Episcopal Church, true to form, hopped aboard that train after it left the political station. I mean, they gave it to Joe Biden to take forward in Congress. Therefore, you know it's not going to go anywhere. This is an opportunity to pray for the Episcopal Church. Um, they're not beyond God's redemption. It, you know, if, if God can redeem me, the Episcopal Church and its leadership is a breeze. And I ask you know, that you take this opportunity this week, the Holy Week, where we recognize the, the, the miracle of God has in life, that you pray for the Episcopal Church as well. Amen. On the other line from some dark country, I have Alan Haley on the, on the line, and uh, it's 10 a.m. here on the East Coast. What time is it over yonder? 7 a.m., but the sun's, <laughs> sun hasn't peeped up yet, because we're on daylight savings times, remember? <laughs> yes. So we're going to discuss uh, you know, a little bit of what's going on in the Episcopal Church uh, in the uh, Anglican Church of North America, and specifically we're going to talk about uh, San Joaquin, Quincy, Fort Worth, and the Diocese of South Carolina. Breaking last night before uh, most of us went to bed was uh, some lawsuit, uh, a, a, I'm sorry, a, a filing in the state court in South Carolina by the Episcopal Church um, answering some claims, and they're saying there's a conspiracy going on here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's just the least of it. It's, uh, what they did was they responded to the lawsuit brought by Bishop Lawrence's diocese and his uh, affiliated parishes. Mm -hmm. I remember they filed just for declaratory relief, saying just that they own title to their own properties and their name and the name the Episcopal Diocese of South Carolina. Well, in response, uh, they filed a huge, long uh, counterclaim and alleging that uh, all of the property of all the parishes in the diocese belongs to the Episcopal Church and its remnant diocese. And they want a declaratory relief, they want uh, damages against individuals, they want uh, conversion, which is a claim that if somebody has taken property that you had and used, converted it to their own use. So the premise here is that you have to have the property first, own it yourself before it can be converted by someone else. There's a little 
Now, logical difficulty with that allegation, but that's in the complaint. And then, they, as I say, they top it off with a uh, count for civil conspiracy, uh, which just says everybody conspired to deprive the Episcopal Church of its property here, and we want um, remedies against all these individuals. So uh, what they're doing is they're just upping the ante um, in any way and shape that they can. They filed the federal court suit. This is following the same pattern it did in Texas. They've got the um, parishes that are going with the remnant diocese also joining in the lawsuit. So it's a general parish diocese wide war um, with attorneys and claims multiplying uh, like uh, hot cakes, I guess. <laughs> and it's sort of a, uh, you know, it's just one of those litigation Donnybrooks you just can only look at and shake your head. Uh, but this is the style in which they come in and do things. They cannot do anything less. And it's sort of a um, throw everything against the wall and see what sticks kind of approach. Well, let's let's be honest here, and you and I both know this, and maybe some people in the Episcopal Church don't know this, especially the leadership. There's no canon in the Episcopal Church that says they own the property of all the uh, churches around uh, around this nation, right? Well, yeah, distinguish between dioceses and parishes. Mm -hmm. um, there's no, there's the Dennis Canon, which they claim gives them title to the um, property of the parishes, but in South Carolina, that has been ruled ineffectual to create a trust. Mm -hmm. And they apparently need that spelled out for them in bright neon letters, and it's going to get spelled out for them. Um, but anyway, the, uh, and then the, the Dennis Canon itself does not address property belonging to dioceses, so they have to make an argument that ever since the church was founded, all the member dioceses agreed to hold the property in trust for the national church. And that's such a standing of history on its head. Uh, if you were to tell all the dioceses right now in the Episcopal Church that all of their property, all of their bank accounts, all of their uh, diocesan offices, cathedrals, everything like that is belongs to the Episcopal Church, I bet you'd have a revolution going. But that's the official church position in court now. Now, if a bishop were to show evidence or give a, um, some type of a, sit down in a witness chair and say that's not true, what would happen to that bishop? <laughs> well, you saw what happened in Texas and in Quincy. Uh, yeah. I mean, again, you know, if there's something very bad that can be done, you can count on the Episcopal Church to find a way to do it. Okay. And uh, the witness intimidation that they engaged in in Fort Worth and Quincy has, you know, another piece of news has come back to um, bite them now, um, because one of the clergy who was uh, charged with um, for filing that amicus brief in the Fort Worth case, stating simple position that the diocese are the paramount unit of the church and our hierarchy stops with the bishop, um, stating that for stating that position, he was charged with violating Title IV. This is uh, the Reverend Doctor Ephraim Radner, mm -hmm. who is canonically resident in the diocese of Colorado, but is teaching currently up in Toronto at Wycliffe. And so um, it's a, um, a very sad situation that he had to face disciplinary charges, consult an attorney and all that. And he, guess what? He wrote a letter to the justices of the Texas Supreme Court, just private letter, um, informing them of that fact, saying that he didn't think this was proper, but that they should know about it. And they accepted the letter, put it on file, as because he was already on record as an, filing an amicus brief. So, and now that letter is in front of those justices who are authoring the opinion in the case, and they will be able to see exactly what the Episcopal Church, the links that they went to, to try to intimidate and prevent testimony that they didn't like. And no court likes its interference with its process like that. That just cannot look good for them, and they don't care, though. They just go ahead and they just do it. Well, let's revisit something we saw um, South Carolina do last year that was out of the blue. We woke up one day and we found that uh, Bishop Lawrence had given quit cl uh, claim. claim deeds mm -hmm. to all the uh, churches. Right. Is that going to pay off now? Well, yeah, now it's a central issue in the case. The counterclaim just filed yesterday by the Episcopal Church lists all the quit claim deeds and says that they were null and void ab initio, in other words, from the beginning, uh, because there was no authority on the part of the diocese to transfer the interest of the diocese in that property to the parishes and to quit claim it, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's just making up law out of the top of your head. Uh, there is, again, 
you know, the diocese are the supreme authority of the Episcopal Church. People have got to get rid of this notion that the Episcopal Church is some glorious uh, hyperstructure over and above, arching above all the dioceses with power to come down. The diocese, just for example, imagine if the Episcopal Church wanted to order a diocese to, say, hold same-sex marriages. Uh, it wouldn't happen. Not in, no. <laughs> in, it wouldn't happen in Dallas, for, in the Diocese of Dallas, for example. And what could it do? I mean, it, it's the way, um, you know, J Thomas Jefferson once famously said of a decision by Chief Justice John Marshall, well, the Chief Justice has made his decision, now let him enforce it. The point is the Supreme Court doesn't have any troops. And, <clears throat> and the same thing here, the Episcopal Church doesn't have any troops. All they can do is go into court and try to sue a diocese for its property, making these outlandish claims. And it's ridiculous, and it needs to be finally put a halt to and called once for all. And I think South Carolina is going to be the place where it'll happen. Well, so it's, it's chicken and egg arguments. Which came first? 815 did not make the diocese. No, exactly. The diocese made 815. Well, actually, yeah. they made yeah they made the general convention. The convention and, and for the first 160 years of its history, general convention mm -hmm. was simply a, a gathering of people for two or three weeks out of you know out of every three years. So what is that one percent of the time or two percent of the time uh, total that it's in session? And it's just a, was a vehicle for hearing reports of the status mm -hmm. of the church in the various dioceses. And they, you know, would pass some national canons, which everybody wanted to be uniform across the church. That's fine. And they would approve bishops and things like that. But apart from that, they had little, no business to accomplish. And so three years was plenty. And then gradually what happened was the institution of the presiding bishop began to accrete um, bureaucrats and offices to itself. It first got severed from being a diocesan office for the first uh, 200 years almost of our church, the presiding bishop was also a diocesan bishop, mm -hmm. had his own diocese to run. And uh, when they broke that off, then the presiding bishop started having more time on his or her hands and started building up more staff and bureaucracy so that uh, it was by the 1950s and uh, then general, I mean the 815 had really grown into a considerable force in the church. And that has led to a transformation because now, of course, naturally, that bureaucracy sees itself as all important and has to justify a reason for its existence and the money it spends on its lavish headquarters in downtown New York and all this kind of thing. And it, you see the ingrown of an institution that way that is very unhealthy for the institution. So uh, that's yeah, what we're suffering right now. We saw a report that they're renting out one of the floors of 815. Uh, <laughs> Now, a quick update. Uh, San Joaquin, what's going on? Okay, San Joaquin, what's that? We're still waiting for the judge to finalize his decision there. The tentative decision was in favor mm -hmm. of the diocese withdrawing um, and denying summary judgment to the Episcopal Church. Uh, but he has it under advisement, and we'll, we won't know until he issues his final decision whether he's going to stick to that ruling. Um, in San Joaquin also, there are a few parishes, I should say, that are giving up yeah, the fight right. yeah they're giving up the fight they, they can't justify the spending of more of thousands and thousands of dollars on these individual lawsuits that were filed against them so we have the uh, St. James in Sonora and St. Paul's in Bakersfield that's Mark Lawrence's old church and uh, St. Michael's Ridgecrest they're all vacating their properties in within a couple of months or so and turning it back and just going on to lead their lives free and clear of the uh, litigious Episcopal Church mm -hmm. Then in Quincy, um, we are starting trial there on the claims of the, again, whether the diocese can leave the church with its property and bank accounts intact. And that starts on April 9th. <clears throat> it'll go for three days or so at the beginning, and then it'll uh, wait a week and then start up again and probably take the rest of the month. And that's going to be a, a major trial. And again, it's in front of a judge who has indicated he gets the issues, he understands the the things he's very careful and very deliberate, so we have hopes that we'll get a reasonable decision there. And Fort Worth was the uh, uh, Ethan Radner uh, piece. I um, want to thank you for your time this morning. Okay. I see the sun slowly breaking <laughs> in the in the background. <laughs> yep. You have a wonderful Easter, Alan. All right, Kevin. Happy Easter to you yeah. and to all the Anglican unscripted viewers. George, let's close out the show. 
It's a short and Anglican Unscripted this week. We expect you guys to go to church and celebrate Holy Week. Um, understand that this is really a time for you and not a time just to sit and watch us. I know it's fun to watch us, but let's let's be honest. George and I are deliberately making a, a, a short Anglican Unscripted so you can go to church and participate in Holy Week. Um, George, we're going to North Carolina. What will we be doing there? We're going to the new Wineskins Conference in Ridgecrest next week. Mm hmm kind of fun um, this is a I've got, went to the last new wineskins and um, it's really a great time to get together and network and le learn about the missions of the church and it's amazing every time I go to these new wineskins conference you people walk out and they walk out missionaries and they seek out missions in, in this country or foreign countries it's an awesome time hopefully I'll be able to live stream it it really depends on the internet there which is iffy at best this is out in Asheville, middle of nowhere, uh, North Carolina, and sometimes <clears throat> Morse code goes faster. Never know. We'll see what happens. Uh, if not, I'll certainly post the videos on Anglican TV later. Um, George, how's the healing going? People keep emailing us saying, how's George, how's George, how's George? Day by day, I'm getting better. I, I, I've had a bit of a plateau, uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, so not having the tremendous leaps and bounds I've had over the past few weeks, but mm -hmm. slowly and surely, uh, life is getting better. Well, this is another Anglican unscripted opportunity. Um, I'm putting George's email here so you can write him emails of encouragement. Um, it's also the same email he uses for his PayPal account, but that's neither here nor there. I didn't really mention that. And we can, you know, encourage George. And it's also time for you guys who are viewers to pray for George. We believe in healing. We believe that God heals us and by his stripes that we are healed. And we do that by asking for prayer. Um, George and I have overcome many difficulties as hosts of Anglican Unscripted through your prayers and your concerns and your encouragement. We ask that you will continue to do that. Um, wish you all a happy Easter, and um, I'm going to put up a Bible verse here as we close out the show, and it, it's going to remain up until George does his, his closing, but I want you to think about that in terms of giving to Anglican Unscripted and Anglican Teeth this year, because we need money to travel, and uh, I know you don't like it when I just, I show up without George, so we need to raise more money to do that. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 69 of Anglican Unscripted. Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 69. You're watching two of your favorite Anglican personalities sit down and talk about Everything Anglican. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And this week's episode is brought to you by the New Win... New Win... Have you been drinking new wine? Uh, no, I've been drinking <laughs> iced tea. Uh, but it's been brought to you by something. <laughs> I thought the paralysis was in the hands, not in the face. <laughs> it's spreading. <laughs> it's cure no, the Botox in injections. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I don't need that. I need uh, follic in injections there. Oh. oh, hair club for men? Yes, right. <laughs> hair club for blondes. I'll take it. Three, two, one.